All right. I believe this means we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions, welcome to another Monday morning tech chat show on the SGGQA podcast channel. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, also known as Some Gadget Guy, the SGG of this horrifically named podcast series, and the QA, of course, standing for question and answer. I like to make my podcasty endeavors as interactive as we can and i'm already seeing an amazing group of uh faces and uh and handles in the live stream in the live chat already but this is why i like to host my podcast as a monday morning show it gives us some time to sort out the news of the last week maybe some news broke over the weekend we can kind of put all of our feels together And make sure that we're staying on top of some of these news topics, that we're not just letting them slip through the cracks. We're not just falling for that gimmick of a a trending topic on Twitter or a a catchy headline that that creates a bunch of outrage porn. We really want to follow these top tech stories and make sure we're, uh, we're staying on the pulse. I'm seeing th- this is already a great crew. I- I- I'm sorry I, I had to, uh, you know, I-, I had that time delay on starting the podcast. Uh, Jeff, uh, LFA Reviews, is is starting a new job. And he just popped in to say, hey, and I'm super proud of him. He's he's making those moves and, and getting that money. We've got Three-Legged Couch, Aditya Anil, Two Spirits, Matt Tyler, Dank Pickman, Sentinel909, Q3 Becker, Andy, Chatty, Nada, Dave. <laughs> I'm missing, I'm missing uh, Keynes, uh, Al- Alice Buckley. Uh There are other people in here too. <laughs> Root Knight. <laughs> we got a good, we got a good crew. Good crew. Big crew today, Dave Burns. Big crew today. Simon says Hypno. Also saying good afternoon, uh, folks. We've got a ton of news to cover. Um, well, first off, just before we jump into some housekeeping, I hope you all had a lovely weekend. You got some time to unplug. Um, I I uh, I did not. <laughs> it was a busy weekend uh, for 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 me and my family. But some, a lot of it was really good stuff. We're we're trying to uh, fix up an old bike. Uh, some friends of ours had this this cute little um, uh, back pedal brake um bike uh kids bike and so we're trying to fix that up we're going to show lex actually after this podcast is over i'm going to show her how to swap tires and put in new tubes i know she's not yet five but it you know disassembling and cleaning up a bicycle is is like one of the my favorite all-time sort of mechanical puzzles so i'm really looking forward to that this afternoon and then on top of that we just have a ton of tech commentary um, hitting hitting the webs today. This is going to be a slightly news heavier show, but then we also got word from Corning. I I, I am not super expert at material science. I'm I'm an audio guy, <laughs> like sound reinforcement and the physics of sound. Um, but I, I took a conference call with the folks at Corning to talk about Victus and. Uh, what it might mean for next year's smartphones and, and gadgets and stuff. Dave Burns won in the art of bicycle maintenance. I, I should I should write a book. Um, no, I'm not that good. I'm not the guy. Um, but I used to field strip mountain bikes. So, uh, yeah, I, I at least know a little of what I'm doing with, with uh, you know, sort of some tools in my hands, some some levers and some pulleys and and, you know, bicycle chain degreaser. It's good times. Um, but we, we've got. We, we, we can save that for a future video or podcast, I'm sure. Oh, Matt Tyler, the color of the bike parts was heavily discussed. Yeah, it, it, it was, it was um, you know, my daughter is, is an action princess. She loves pink and sparkles and stuff like that. But she's also super into characters that do things. Like, she really loves action adventures um, as much as she enjoys a good tea party um, from time to time. But it was really a challenge. It's this cute little white bike frame with a, a white wicker basket on the front. And uh, I was I was trying to shop around and get white wall tires. I wanted to get some some like pink or lavender pedals. And you're like, it is so hard finding not only kids stuff, but kids stuff in fun colors for bicycles right now where it's not total garbage. Um, like I was I was picking up some pedals and going, oh, these would like snap off. <laughs> these are crap. <laughs> Anyway, I digress. 
l- let's uh, let's knock out some some housekeeping real quick. Uh, I'm gonna try and fly through housekeeping because I'm I'm really trying not to make this podcast three hours long, and we do have some topics that I want to spend a little time digging into. And I had a lot of stuff go out last week, just like we've been uh, cranking some of the work uh, recently. Three-legged couch. That is a very kind and generous estimate for housekeeping. He's saying four minutes. Um, it's 9.06 in the a.m., so let's let's fly through. Uh, kicking over into screen share. Airdrop for Android nearby share tutorial. Android users finally have a wireless file sharing protocol similar to AirDrop. It should uh, be backwards compatible, I think, all the way to Android 7. But if you just want a quick and dirty tutorial on how to set it up and use it for the very first time, I have a one-minute long video that should show you some good step-by-steps. Then I also, this was a fun review to put together. This is the Zero Lemon 90-watt four-port charger. And when Zero Lemon reached out, I know Zero Lemon is being a battery company. Like in the article, I even show this picture of the Zero Lemon battery that I now have in my uh, Galaxy Note 4. So they sent over this charger. It's not a battery. So I was a little embarrassed getting all ready to review that. And I I agreed to review something that I did not know what it actually was. Um, But that's a written article on somegadgetguy.com. Then the biggie of last week was uh, I felt more confident calling a video a review for the LG Velvet now that we know how much it's going to cost in North America. We finally got AT&T pricing at $599. And so I put this video together just talking about uh, Velvet, my experiences using Velvet, and what this price-to-performance ratio means now. There was a lot of concern over Velvet at the South Korean pricing because the exchange rate would have meant that, oh, this is going to be like a $750 phone. $599. $599. And now we've got a phone that competes really well against a Galaxy A71 and can be other things. So there's a lot of cranky soapboxing in my reviews, as per usual. But you can catch the review. I mean, it's mostly talking about the phone, but I did have to kind of respond to some of those LG dog whistles like, oh, the software is terrible. And you're like, no, it's LG software. There's still room for improvement, but it's never been better and updates are great. Oh, it's so thick compared to what? So there's there's a lot of that kind of back and forth um, crankiness uh, looking at. Uh, one of my reviews. And then over the weekend, I I mean, anytime I get the opportunity to play with some interesting audio gear, and and I really need to like preface this, like, I I find it so troubling. I was just in a conversation on the Some Gadget Guy Discord. Um, A lot of my reviews lean positive. But really, what's critical is how broad is the demographic. So this might be the exact right fit gadget for like five people. But as long as we're being honest about that, I feel those five people who are going to absolutely love that gadget deserve a positive review. Not one of these snarky eye rolly, well, I guess you could use one of these things if you're into that, but I'm so over it because I'm on YouTube. No, 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 no. That's BS. If, if you're interested in this type of gadget and you want to know what it really can and can't do then you deserve the same quality conversation as someone who owns a really popular gadget or accessory. So Helm, they're in pre-sale right now. This is the Helm DB12 uh, mobile amp. It's a tiny little bugger. I I don't know if I've got it over here on my desk. Uh, I've got to reach. It's a tiny little bugger, and it it does one, well, it kind of does a few things, but it its main purpose is to do one thing, just make audio much louder off of a headphone jack. And, and it is. It's a headset connector, TRRS, so it does have mic line uh, input. And that it also, the buttons actually control your phone, um, which we don't always have on Android. You know, that was something that was really popular on iOS accessories that we never, um, we, we don't always get consistently for Android. It's expensive, but it does what it sets out to do really well and so it's 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 interesting trying to like quantify that conversation where it absolutely lives up to the manufacturer's claims it's a totally niche product so i mean 
for the right consumer and not to pass that off, right? How many times have you seen a video where, well, I mean, for the right person, I guess they might like this, but it's not for me. <laughs> you know, like you see that a lot in, in tech reviews. If you care about those kinds of features, this is something that should be on your radar. Like this is an accessory you you might care about and that's not to write it off. It's being specific about who I'm trying to talk to for, for a gadget review like that. So those were the major uh, um, articles published. And then just one other, I'm kind of proud of how this video came out. I worked with the team over at Newegg to do a feature video on micro ATX PC cases and what you might want to look at for a micro ATX build. Um, and, and this is something that was kind of helpful for me because uh, early on in my tenure at Newegg, when I started doing some work with Newegg, I had the hardest time separating micro ATX, just sort of medium sized and smaller form factor PCs from mini ITX. Like I even had to think about, think about saying it right now. Like when I see it written, I totally understand the differences. But as soon as I start speaking, I would swap those terms. Like I just have this massive brain block on keeping those separate. And I have to like physically make my mouth say different words. But we did a feature video talking about PC builds. If you just want something a little smaller, but you're not looking at going all the way down to uh, the absolute um, tiniest behind your TV, <laughs> Dave Burns, micro ATX be the redheaded stepchild of PC building, <laughs> which is fair. Um, so we, we did a primer video on this and, and it's something that I really, I love that the new egg crew is tackling with, with a, a bit more consistency is uh, we, we last week, um, or was it the week before, we talked about some of the PC building videos that were going out there. They have a new video out yesterday or today, um, choosing a GPU. We're talking, you know, stuff that if you're really a, a really experienced PC builder, you you probably already grok what what these videos are about. But this is content that I think we take for granted that it doesn't evolve as aggressively as the market really changes. So you can look up like, what is a GPU? And then you'll see like Radeons from six years ago. And you're like, okay, there's still value. There's still evergreen value in that video, but it would be nice if we were re refreshing some of these entry level and uh, beginner videos with more current information. And that seems to be one of the initiatives that, is, is working. Like it's something that the, the new egg ninjas are, are doing a, a much better job of, of keeping on. Um, so, whew, uh, from not are you planning on making a Plex NAS server in a, in a mini ATX anytime soon? I, so what I need to do, um, not and thanks for bringing that up. Uh, two years ago, I did a video about a Western digital hard drive enclosure that was, absolutely failing on me and it forced me to get another western digital enclosure just so i could recover the information on the drives in that box then last year i did a follow-up video about how that enclosure was starting to twitch on me in the same way that the first enclosure failed so i've replaced that and i'm now running a a qnap as our home media server plex server and then sort of as one part of a multi-stage data backup and, and I'm looking at, well, maybe we could get something as an offsite. Like I want to trade some hard drives with my mom and uh, then we could both, like she could back up stuff on our network and I could back up stuff on her network. It's, it's kind of a longer term goal, but I've been using the QNAP now for almost a year, maybe a little less. Um, and it's, it's so much better. The, uh, it's, it, it is not a, a, a mainstream, you know, like a data security business grade solution. It is totally a home, maybe home office style box of hard drives. So much better than, um, than the Western digital enclosures that I was using. So I need to follow that up because at the end of this journey, um, sorry, short story, incredibly long, not at the end of this journey, what I want to do is make my own. H how does it differ when you get a, a, you know, like a, a mini ITX or a micro ATX box with a processor in there <laughs> and just pack it full of hard drives. What does that add to the experience? And, and 
what type of management's involved to make that a more competitive offering than one of these little pre-built jobs. Um, like, for example, things like having more control over the casing is kind of a big deal. One of my biggest issues with the QNAP is out of the box, it is a rattly little case. Like, I, I had to custom some really ugly solutions with rubber bands just to stop internal case vibrations from the entire time it was under my desk. So things like that, you know, if I were just building directly from my own case, I feel pretty confident, like, I could make a nicer box. <laughs> but the functionality is, it takes a bit more to, to hammer out. So, um, oh, and I do, boing bite, you need that new 2.5 gig, um, uh, gig multi-gigabit switch. Um, I'm... I, I really want to see, like, I think that's going to be another major part for uh, a router upgrade is uh, going to uh, a faster router. Because the QNAP I have, I think even supports 10 gig. I think it's built in to support 10 gig Ethernet. I need to look it up. But it's either 2.5 or 10. I can't remember now. From Matt Tyler, rubber bands solve many problems in the world of tech that they do. Um, <laughs> it's hilarious. So that's, uh, that's housekeeping. Um, I know I definitely went way over, uh, th thank you for the, the four minute estimate, but we knew we, I think we all knew, I think we knew like in our hearts that was never going to happen. So, um, all of the stories that we're going to be talking about, all of the housekeeping links, everything that we're, we're discussing today, it's going to be on the show notes. You can find all of this information on somegadgetguy.com, uh, my website for all good things, Some Gadget Guy. And it was so blank bite saying, I, I, I rocked around 11 minutes, but I feel like 11 minutes with a mini detour into network attached storage conversations is, is okay. Like, that's pretty good for me. All right. Got a ton of news. The The news block is is a little funky this week. The Relicked Couch, four minutes was a bit too optimistic. <laughs> I, I, I would have been close. I would have been close without without talking about Nas um, and, and not hip hop. Uh, again, I can totally divert this into music and movie conversation. One, you know, maybe next week we should just do like a, a what movies have you been watching during this era of social distancing? podcast do can we can, do we want to say that i'm going to leave it up to the folks in the live chat let me know next week do we want to do a movies and games roundup instead of like tech and politics anyone anyone let me know okay Vasico say the I digress podcast. <laughs> I should do that. Like, like, uh, every, every six months I should do a, a complete, you know, but I digress. Um, all right, let let's let let's jump in. Uh, let let's chat some some tech news. Uh, I think the writing's on the wall. Uh, 3G is gonna be dead soon. Uh, we're we're looking at major carriers sort of ending their run of consumer facing 3G solutions, and uh, the two companies to to watch out for um, in this space, especially as it pertains to global support and. Uh, bring your own devices. You know, again, unlocked devices would be carriers like AT and T and T Mobile. So uh, I was actually, you know, I, I caught this minutes after someone posted it. This was about four days ago on the BlackBerry subreddit. Um, let me get the window share. There we go. And someone shared this: uh, Is AT and T phasing out all BlackBerry phones, and when? And so he shares a screenshot saying, Michael, we will soon be upgrading our network to use the latest technologies. These updates are to serve you better and bring faster speeds and greater reliability. But your device ending in this phone number is not compatible with the new network and you need to replace it to continue receiving service. Our team is here to help you find a compatible device that fits your needs. We want to help you transition as seamlessly as possible and ensure your service is not interrupted. And then there's a little bubble link to, to learn more. How frustrating we all know we all know that we're gonna find these network transitions right so we've got carriers pushing into 5g as the top 
the the top option and the premium option. We know LTE is basically going to pick up all of the slack. Voice calls are going to be basically data, voice over LTE, V-O-L-T-E. So how clumsy of AT&T to make it sound like this is an immediate concern? Again, I read the entire notification that was sent to this individual on his old BlackBerry, and this is wholly designed. Like This language is designed to make this seem like it's an urgent concern. You got to flip your phone. Oh, am gosh, this is coming and your device is going to be bricked. It's going to be unusable. You got to move on this. But we know that's not the case. Again, someone already spoiled the uh, <laughs> someone already spoiled my punchline there. Uh, the last at and apologized about it, but it's still trash. Um, <laughs> um, and because part of the problem is isn't just 3G and the last actually has has the, the, the lead on this, too. They're sending this out if you have a 4G LTE device. But you don't. But that device lacks the proper support for what AT and T's VO LTE protocol is going to look like. But then also the frustrating thing about this is, it's not happening this year. It's not happening next year. The planned end date for AT and T three G, so f full support for their their fallback phone call legacy support 3g phone call legacy support is 2022 so this is designed to kind of turn you know kind of twist some uh, some screws right it, it's it's designed to motivate action and and just like where i've been very vocal and very frustrated with our sort of casual response to apple's battery degradation policy well, I guess you need a new phone. We have to throttle your CPU because we can't put in a, a longer-lived battery. Um, again, more for older iPhone devices and the battery throttling as a way to encourage consumer behavior. This this type of notification, this type of notice from AT&T is designed to emotionally get people to react and purchase devices that they don't need to buy right now <laughs> there there's there's no immediacy on this <laughs> so um the uh the follow-up articles have have all been pretty hilarious um so ars technica wrote up a a, a great write-up on this at t claims a phone made in 2019 will stop working urges users to upgrade at t email about phone shutoffs was so confusing, some users thought it was a scam. And in a way, isn't it, isn't it kind of a scam? But, but the thing that we really need to keep on our radar here, um, and it's not necessarily just an issue with planned obsolescence, but as we transition, we, we, I, I think we're going to look back on the 4G era, the LTE era, and... I, while we were living through it, I don't think we all realized just how good we actually had it. You, being able to pop in and out SIM cards, having a lot of compatibility after the initial rollout, obviously. I mean, once we got about two or three years into LTE, and I'm just not sure 5G, as, as we move into an LTE and 5G only era, is going to afford us that same sort of flexibility. It's a major problem that we have here in the United States that I don't think consumers in the EU and the UK and Asian uh, Asian areas are going to have the same types of problems that we do. But already, our 5G rollout is is radically increasing prices over the rest of the world. It's causing more consumer lock-in. So many people will complain, you know, like, oh, I wish the LG V50 came in an unlocked flavor. And you kind of want to ask why. Because unlocked doesn't mean you can take it from T-Mobile to Verizon right now. You know, you're, you're sort of stuck on one carrier for a 5G device at present. And I'm not sure how that's going to evolve if we're going to get to a point where carriers get us back to the same kind of device and mobility freedom that we currently enjoy, where even Verizon on LTE devices kind of had to just open up and let a lot of devices that they don't sell um, operate on their network. Their whitelist still could be better, but um, but it's been super frustrating. 
So while all of this was going on, it, it was like the perfect storm of AT&T hate, right? Because we've been frustrated with AT&T for 5GE, for cloudying, murkying the waters on consumer education for 5G. It's a track record where they they did the same thing with 4G back in the day during LTE launches. And we know that they're going to eventually get 5G up and running. It, it, I, it, someone correct me, isn't it already consumer facing in a few test markets? I, I, I want to say that it is. But, you know, Velvet became kind of an interesting part of AT&T's launch strategy because that's a 5G phone. And AT&T got exclusive, uh, the exclusive launch here in the United States before it goes to um, other carriers. Um Matt Tyler, 5G is a lie. Uh, phones don't need USB-C dongle and companies are liars. Time to get off the hype train. <laughs> it's so dramatic. But hold on, let me take a sip of water. <sighs> Some terrible AS, uh, ASMR drinking sound effects for you there. Because while we were all kind of not thrilled with the way that at t is trying to game their customers is finally stepping on the real 5G uh, bandwagon, but is detailing what I think is actually a pretty um, uh, a pretty reasonable exit strategy for 3G. So if you've got an LTE phone, but it doesn't support VOLTE, you can rock it until 2022. And I feel like that's a good lead time. Next year, what unlocked devices you buy will be a much more sensitive conversation. But currently, you got time. You got at least a year and a half. And if you're still using a phone that you like on AT&T's network as an unlocked device that doesn't support AT&T's uh, VOLTE, 2022. I feel like that's great. But it was really hilarious that T-Mobile kind of snuck in their own exit strategy. And it's a little less kind than AT&T's. <laughs> as much of a fan as I am of T-Mobile as a company. Um, T-Mobile cutting support for pre-VOLTE devices in 2021. <laughs> so their, their exit strategy is a lot more aggressive. This is an article written up by Apple Insider, uh, Mike Peterson over at Apple Insider. T-Mobile will stop supporting phones that aren't compatible with voice over LTE in 2021 with AT&T to follow suit in 2022. Um, they explain what VOLTE is. Since VOLTE is so widespread, some carriers are making plans to stop supporting pre-VOLTE devices and calls. T-Mobile, for example, will require VOLTE in January 2021 according to an internal document leaked by Android police. Essentially, all non-compatible devices will stop working on T-Mobile's network, at least for calls. <laughs> Customers with an older device will need to upgrade, and the change will also impact MVM, MVNO, Metro, and possibly Sprint consumers. January 2021. That's a lot faster. I'm speaking slower for the emphasis because we're already in the end of July 2020. That, I'll be really curious to see if T-Mobile really can phase out. Like, are they really going to flip a switch? Because T-Mobile has long had that reputation for a bring-your-own-device carrier. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking immediate e-wasting of so many phones. And, and the thing is, like, I know T-Mobile has been fairly aggressive about the devices that they sell directly supporting some of these features, but that still doesn't cover everybody. And for all of the tech nerds out there, there's there's been this kind of like you know tech enthusiast geek speak about well maybe I want to import a phone or maybe I want to carry a phone over from another network or maybe I want this kind of unlocked device and now we're facing this type of a transition where in 5 months in 5 months I again I'm going to be really surprised 
I don't know how a carrier can manage or mitigate that kind of network overhaul and transition. I, I have to believe it's an it's a it's a significant not I mean not like a majority, but it is it will be a significant user base um, of customers that that will run into some issues. Um, the nice thing is, I, I think for some of the primary devices. Oh, actually, it says this in the article. I was trying to do this from memory. Um, Apple's iPhone 6 and later do support VOLTE. So say you're on an older iOS device, you're probably going to be fine, especially if you got that through T-Mobile. But it's the Android side of the equation where we all fancy ourselves mavericks. And we love the customization and we love having options. And I just want to pop in a SIM card and I don't want carrier branding or carrier apps. We, those folks might get burned. <laughs> I, I mean, like, this is so silly. I kind of love that my first generation original launch week iPhone SE is still going to work. <laughs> it's the phone I keep coming back to is this magic little mighty mouse of an iPhone even more so than the iPhone SE 2020, I just adore that little iPhone 5S build style. And it's going to probably support T-Mobile VOLTE. So I get to keep it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, again, so the last makes a good point. The iPhone might support VOLTE, but then you have to think, but you have to think, are those spectrums going away? So again, the, the I kind of feel like for a lot of consumers out there, LTE has picked up a lot of the slack. 3G becomes more of a fallback, and especially on GSM networks, AT&T and T-Mobile. The, the, I mean, remember those commercials from way back in the day in the early launches of 4G, um, you know, the, the iPhone on AT&T was the first phone that could take a phone call and surf the Internet at the same time. And it was because of that 3G fallback. It was literally just like pointing two different radios um, uh, at, at towers to accomplish two tasks at the same time. But if voice calls are basically going to be data, um, you, you don't really need the fallback. So those frequencies that air that spectrum can be put towards 5G rollout. Because we can be pretty confident that carriers aren't going to dump a ton of money into improving LTE. Everything is going to be box swaps on towers to start getting 5G more competitive. Um, that's going to be an aggressive race. And then LTE becomes sort of a data fallback. It'll become what 3G was for us over the last couple of years. But, um, you know, it just makes me happy. I, like, I, if they really do pull this off in, in January... I'm going to have to make a feature video on my original iPhone SE going, oh, it still works. <laughs> Daybo9, their map showed all of the country turning their color. It works everywhere. I hate coverage maps so much. So, yeah, something to keep on the radar. Um I feel like those of us watching a podcast like this or having a conversation like this about um, different devices, uh, we're probably in, in good shape. But how many family and friends do we have that might be rocking like way older phones? You know, like the 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 occasional fun I have in pulling out my V10 or my Note 4 and getting a SIM card adapter and putting my SIM card in there and just using that for a day or two because I've got a ridiculous museum of phones. There are real consumers out there who are on these much, much older devices. And this turning of the screw, especially if it is this fast, I can't I can't imagine. You know, like I, I'm really curious what their internal numbers look like for kind of pushing this aggressively. And, and not leaving a lot of their customers behind. From DSO Thorne, from Verizon's website, as we complete our network transition to 4G and 5G, we at Verizon would like to keep you up to date with some important activities. Currently, 3G and 4G non-HD voice CDMA devices can't be activated for any new line of service. That's a good policy. 
for as cranky as I get about how Verizon manages their network and how they whitelist devices, that's really smart. If you're going to have as walled off a garden as Verizon maintains, I, I mean, that's the right play. I'm sorry, we can't let you activate this on our network. We will be discontinuing support for these services soon. I'm, I'm Again, I'd rather Verizon just operate a more globally compatible network, but considering the realities of doing business with Verizon, that's that's a better play. Gary the Fireman, what a, what about WiMAX? I I still like I, I need to see if I can fix it. Um I have my Samsung uh Epic 4G, the slider keyboard Galaxy S1. I, you know, like I know WiMAX has to be dead, but there were still a few of those like business you remember like WiMAX they tried to keep it alive by making it like a business wireless protocol or something like that and I'm still just like morbidly curious if is there any operating WiMAX could I war drive my Galaxy S1 and find some WiMAX <laughs> ah. all right moving right along um, just a bit of a funny, a funny uh, article here, but one that feeds into some of the conversations we've been having about some of the more important uh, lawsuits uh, coming up. Uh, let me get this out of the way here. Uh, I just love seeing Steve Wozniak show up in in article titles. This one coming by way of Engadget. Steve Dent wrote this up. Uh, Steve Wozniak sues Google for not acting on YouTube Bitcoin scams. Excuse me. From the article, Steve Wozniak has filed a lawsuit against YouTube saying the site has repeatedly ignored his requests to take down phony Bitcoin giveaways that use his name. He compared YouTube's actions to Twitter, which quickly removed similar scams after Wozniak and other celebrities were infamously hacked last week, he said in the complaint. Wozniak filed the suit along with the 17 other alleged victims. They want the court to force YouTube and parent company Alphabet to take the videos down and warn users about the scam while seeking compensation and punitive damages. So um, this is, in the sneakiest way possible, this is actually a really important lawsuit to keep an eye on. We've been talking about uh, the Communications Decency Act, specifically Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And we've been talking about organizations like Facebook and YouTube for a while, where they get to claim immunity from what gets posted on their service, but they also still seem to exercise editorial control when it suits them to keep their advertisers happy. This is the, an extremely bizarre best of both worlds situation, which is utterly unsustainable. Uh, um, and again, for a much more learned conversation about what this means, I would highly recommend, I cannot recommend enough that you catch Legal Eagle on YouTube. Um, uh, Legal Eagle DJ has some awesome just some fantastic videos on like fair use and copyright, but he does tackle this this idea. The the uh, he digs into Section two thirty and why it's not a violation of free speech, but this is why Republicans are attacking it, and this is why Democrats are attacking it. Here we have a really good legal challenge for someone, an, an individual with with a, a, a notable amount of celebrity challenging this this position this best of both worlds position and he's doing it in a way that i i haven't seen anyone bringing up in the context of of section 230 before because he's suing over youtube getting to profit off of someone else stealing his likeness but this could be one of those regulatory wedge lawsuits where we'll now have to confront and we'll have to see how do we reform this protection? Because I do believe 
in 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 sort of a a fair a fair internet balanced conversation with services that compete against each other what gets posted on a platform or what gets posted on a forum or what gets posted should not be the responsibility of the operator of that forum but then i also believe that means we should have a different regulatory classification than what we currently have and that is an insanely complicated 21st century conversation to have now this kind of stuff is going to get tested and we'll we'll have to see in a, in in a court of law tested in a court of law it's already being tested as a social experiment <laughs> um but now we should we should keep an eye on this to see how this plays out because what is YouTube's responsibility for safeguarding the content on their platform? They claim, and again, you can go back to Sundar Pichai uh, testifying before Congress. Google doesn't remove content. And then an hour later into the conversation, they have a conversation about how Google removes content on their various platforms. Um, now, once you start getting into what type of editorial control Alphabet might have over YouTube, that does stand in conflict with the the sort of spirit of what Section 230 uh, represents. So this is, a I again, in the silliest way possible, Wozniak is complaining about Bitcoin. That's the headline. Under that is a very interesting legal challenge to a long-term precedent that kind of allows the internet to function. I mean, without Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, it would be basically impossible for any online service to really function with any type of user submitted content. And now we need to see how do we refine that relationship? Because I don't think it should be killed, but it needs to evolve because its current form is broken and completely unsustainable. Um, Simon says, Hypno, he should have filed a copyright notice and takedown against the videos YouTube loves to demonetize. Uh, so if, if we were only talking about immediately fixing the problem of Steve Wozniak's likeness being used to scam people, you're absolutely correct. But from Steve Wozniak's perspective, that is a symptom of the disease, and he wants to go after the disease. Like, he's not trying to just alleviate one symptom. He's trying to cut off the head of the problem and that's going to be exceedingly difficult again it, it it's going to mean a, a a legal reframing of how we do business on the internet to start fixing that problem and and this could be a 10 year 20 year conversation again with how our courts work how the law works we might not fix this in in the next decade or two decades that's what's so fascinating about watching this these types of steps come by again we talked about lindsey graham trying to you know build back doors and 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 weaken encryption there was another bill i think that went before congress that had similar aspirations of reducing consumer protections for online data and traffic and as soon as you really look at the context of those bills you can see some obvious problems like that absolutely destroys the banking industry, the online banking industry. Like you've just made, you know, uh, med uh, online medicine completely insecure. You, like, we really can't do that. We, we or we, I mean, we shouldn't. We can do it and then it's going to be terrible for everybody, but we shouldn't do that. So now here we've got a legal challenge that's going to have to stand up in court. And it's coming from Steve Wozniak looking beyond just his likeness getting getting uh, used by these scammers. It's it's fascinating stuff. Um, oh, and Simon says, if no, and yeah, I, I was saying it's a Band-Aid. I was just talking about the short term. Absolutely accurate. I mean, again, if we were just looking at that one part of it, you're totally correct. DMCA can be used very effectively in a situation like this. But we also want to look a bit broader and Steve Wozniak is one of those dudes like he, he is just a, a a a true geek in that sense where he's seeing a problem and like a good engineer well how do we fix that problem okay well let's do that <laughs> which is just awesome it's just super adorable all right moving right along um Gary the fireman I'm also going to join you in some thumb thumbs ups 
Uh, thank you so much for supporting production on this channel and those subscriptions are greatly appreciated. Uh, I'm terrible at the Twitch um, and keeping up with that kind of stuff, but you, you guys are making me look way better than I probably deserve. Um, just another, I'll be curious to see how this plays out because the main headline has Apple in it because you, know, you can always count on better SEO if you put Apple in the headline of a story. But this one's a little bit broader. It's another lawsuit that we should keep our eyes on. Um, uh, let me get back into screen share. So from patentlyapple.com, Koss, an American pioneer in headphones, has filed a five-count patent infringement lawsuit against Apple. Now, again, we're, we're, we're saying like, oh, Koss is suing Apple. Actually, Koss is going after a number of audio manufacturers, not just Apple. Like I think JBL is listed in this lawsuit, um, in, in a similar lawsuit, and then a couple other manufacturers too. Like I might, I think maybe even Bose. I, I don't think they say it here in this article. But anyway, um, written up in the article here, Cost Corporation, who invented the first high fidelity stereo phones, has filed a five count patent infringement lawsuit against Apple. It's no secret that Apple is about to launch an over ear headphone, and Apple's success is going to be bad news for Cost. With that said, Cost states that Apple and others are reaping enormous benefits due to John C. Koss's vision and Koss Corporation's commitment to that vision for more than six decades. After four meetings with Apple and making it clear that their audio products were without a doubt infringing on Koss patents, it was clear that Apple wasn't going to admit infringement. Um, so I want to scroll down here. They talk about when Koss was uh, created. Uh, doo -doo -doo. There we go. In closing their introductory case, they get down to the bottom line. Koss brings the instant lawsuit because the industry has caught up to Koss's early 2000 visions. The technology Koss developed as part of its substantial Strivia investment has become standardized, with whole listening ecosystems having been built around the techniques Koss conceived of over a decade ago. So this is a pretty far-reaching... Again, the... the, the main complaint you know targeting apple you go after a company that that's got the big headlines in the deep pockets but um this is a this is going to be interesting to see how it plays out because it's not quite patent trolling but also we've come to sort of accept a certain again audio tech is funny audio tech doesn't evolve like other forms of technology and, and one of the reasons why I get so sad about so many phones ditching the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack is because it's been such a universally held and accepted standard that it became kind of just common intellectual property. You can't license 3.5 millimeter. You know, if you want to use a lightning connector for a pair of, of earbuds, that's a substantially higher investment to start before you can actually make the earbuds to license proprietary technologies. And in the world of putting two drivers on your ears to listen to music in a, in a more personal fashion, some of these head, uh, some of these patents kind of veer into territory where I feel like costs waited too long to defend their intellectual property. And it's become kind of common property. Now, a court will have to decide whether or not that's accurate. But um, the five patents that they, uh, let me get this here, the five patents that they're supposedly infringing on, um, system with wireless earphones, configuring wireless devices for a wireless infrastructure network, and then three others that just say system with wireless earphones. So, uh, you know, digging into some of these patents, I understand their ability to protect IP I'll be very curious to see if a court and a judge agrees that these are proprietary systems that are defendable and not broadly accessible. Like other companies could have arrived at the same solution through some an, an easy path of, of engineering an audio discipline. So... If Koss wins this, a number of companies are really going to have to to start flipping cash over to Koss and start paying for intellectual property and licensing and and this type of tech. But I I feel like that ship might have sailed. 
So so I, I belong to Halo 2. Again, it's it's not it's right bordering on there. He uh, I belong to Halo 2 says it sound almost sounds like a patent troll. Um yeah, kind of close. Kind of close. The only thing is it's not like Koss bought these patents from some defunct company and it's super obscure and now they're they're trying to squeeze companies for money. We are talking about um technology and design that Koss came up with. I mean, again, I my very, very, very first pair of over ear headphones were Koss. Um, you know, my dad got them for me for my ninth birthday. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's not like this is without some kind of precedent. It's just in defending these patents now, are these defendable proprietary pieces of intellectual property or have we all just sort of agreed and moved on? <laughs> and then now a judge is going to have to rule on that. <laughs> Dave Burns, you've been an audio geek forever, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ugh. It's been a long life of, of audio geekery. Someday I'll tell you about how I hacked my Fisher Price, that really ugly tan hard plastic with the handle, uh, Fisher Price uh, tape deck, so that I could use it with microphones and I would record radio dramas. And then, you know, like just stop and record, stop and record, stop and record. And they, they were awful, but um, yeah, I, I destroyed that Fisher Price. All right, um, real quick, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on this, and we're getting it close to that hour, and we, we have a couple more stories that I want to hit before um, before we get to the Reddit block. Um, first, Instagram spying on you. I, I, it, we, we seem to get evidence every week that Facebook and Instagram kind of suck, and uh, now iOS 14, yet another app sort of uh, caught by iOS 14. Why? Oh, it's totally a bug. It's totally a bug that when you're just looking through your Instagram feed, that Instagram would start looking at your camera. Oopsies. Totally a goofy on our part. Whoopsie doos. Um, BS. I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a second. I, I have no evidence. I can't make any type of, of journalistic claim. But there is no reason... Any piece of software like an app like that should be accessing your camera when you're using a part of the app that has nothing to do with your camera. And I feel, I, I don't care how complicated your infrastructure is. I don't care how you know bloated your app has become. At some point in dog fooding your software, you catch that and you fix it. And, and Facebook as a company has given us no reason no reason to trust any of their intentions when it comes to consumer data privacy. Dave Burns, whoopsie daisy, didn't mean to creep on you. <laughs> oh, it's the bright side of the OnePlus 7 Pro with the pop-up camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, again, uh, you know, I, there was, uh, what was it? It was the, one of the Huawei Matebooks, too. You know, like, as soon as you just drop the, the webcam, like, I guess you could still hack the mics, you know, if you wanted to listen in on someone. But it's it's hilarious. I I, I, I don't have words. Yet another data security issue. Facebook just recently settled another user privacy situation. I want to say it was like, oh, we'll we'll pay six hundred million dollars. And you're like, you you profit to the tune of billions on leaking consumer data. So. 500 billion is 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 like blink and you'll miss it money on on a rate sheet it's it's just it's galling at this point because the other major stories that, that we're gonna have to follow up on and i was really hoping we could talk about this but it's it's getting postponed i think i might try and do a live stream it's gonna be this wednesday um we we started talking about this a little while ago and we, we've been talking about how google and alphabet are basically facing some type of antitrust investigation in every state, but I think Alabama. For some reason, Alabama's like, cool, whatever, we don't care. The whole rest of the country, in, in some form or fashion, is investigating Google to some degree. And even at the federal level, a highly anticipated antitrust hearing featuring the CEOs of Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google will reportedly be postponed. This is coming from Market Insider, Business Insider, written up by Avery uh, Avery Hartman's. 
Uh, Monday's congressional antitrust hearing with four major tech CEOs is likely to be postponed. Um, the highly anticipating here, highly anticipated hearing, come on, select the text, uh, scheduled for noon on Monday, planned to examine the business practices of Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google with lawmakers probing whether those companies using, whether those companies used their market power to crush smaller rivals. This is going to be a major undertaking. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, I'm a little doubtful that our current elected officials um, have the wherewithal and acumen to do this well, but it's timely. Um, I, I think I might, I might try and do just sort of a Wednesday live stream. Um, just have it on playing, we can talk, chat it out, could be kind of interesting. I, again, I fear that they're going to go through like a two hour committee, you know, uh, uh, get, getting getting um, uh, interrogation. <laughs> That's not the right word. Um, but they're going to ask questions of these CEOs and our media is going to cherry pick one or two terrible questions from like the oldest members of the committee. You know, someone going, well, I have it. I had an Internet get blocked on my iPhone and they're holding up a Samsung, you know, like that's going to be all you really hear about. But again, when we saw Sundar Pichai testifying before Congress, once you got about an hour in, there were some really interesting little pieces of information that I feel like kind of slipped by Mr. Pichai, uh, especially in terms of how their content is, is managed. If you don't pay attention to some of those questions when asked in a legal framework. You miss out on what our lawmakers can and can't do as it pertains to regulating, regulating the, the internet space. Because this is coming right on the heels. This, this was another story, just kind of a frustrating situation um, linked from Business Insider again. Um, Amazon reportedly invested in startups and gained proprietary information before launching competitors, often crushing the smaller companies in the process. Amazon is basically the name in online shopping, right? There, there isn't one single direct competitor that that represents a fraction of what Amazon can accomplish. And uh, my wife and I, we have family friends who operated their own small business. Um, years ago, they got uh, romanced by Amazon to start offering their solutions on Amazon. And in light of social distancing, they've now been accused of price gouging, even though Amazon has basically replicated their business model and has jacked prices up significantly higher on some of their, their, their goods than what they have. So Amazon is trying to get them to admit to wrongdoing that they didn't do and can kick them off of the Amazon platform after having replicated their business model. And I feel if we really care about having healthy competition in a capitalistic society, I feel that's wrong. <laughs> like I feel that should be against some kind of rule. <laughs> so again, this, this, uh, this Senate hearing, this uh, antitrust investigation, it's very timely. I'm just so anxious that we don't have the talent in our politicians to really pull this off. <laughs> Simon says, if no, Amazon also offers lending. Um, what did Amazon actually, they also added, was it car insurance? Like you can get your car insurance through Amazon now. Again, looking at every financing and business model and, and how to put those pieces together. Now you can get your insurance through Amazon. It's, it's so bizarre. Uh, again, I'm, I'm getting closer and closer um, just outright agreeing with folks like Elizabeth Warren that maybe an Amazon is too big to be one distinct entity. And like mom, pa, bell for phone lines back in the day, we should be looking at some kind of divestiture. You know, uh, you know a a Amazon brick and mortar should be a different company than Amazon online sales, which should be a different company than Amazon web services. I think we might be getting there. I just, again, I don't, I don't know how to do that fair and gracefully 
in a legalistic sense with our current set of laws and regulations. <clears throat> Dave Burns, are you saying that Amazon partakes in anti-competitive practices? I'm not. I am not making that claim as I stream this on Twitch. Um, the Sentinel 909, it's always wrist slap, pay like a parking ticket type fine. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> and from Alice Bockley, this is the big concern because at some point these types of business practices absolutely stifle competition. Okay, one last fun little story just because I have no idea what to make of this and it's super uh, cloudy and sketchy right now, but there's a part of my little geek heart that hopes. I hate it when I get my hopes up and then we don't really get something cool, but would any of y'all be down for a return of G4 TV? Coming by way of Variety, written up by Todd Spangler, Long Dormant Gaming Network G4 TV teases 2021 relaunch by Comcast Spec Spectacore. Ooh, that's hard to say. Um, <clears throat> After nearly six years sitting in mothballs, the G4 video game TV network is coming back with some kind of relaunch, uh, relaunch next year by Comcast. On Friday, the Twitter accounts of G4 TV and G4's Attack of the Show and X-Play uh, two popular shows on the network, both posted the same cryptic teaser video captioned, we never stopped playing. The video culminates with the numerals 2021. Um, but what's funny is like they actually reached out. Um, Adam Sessler, who co-hosted G4's X-Play video game review series, responded to the reemergence of the G4 property with a tweet saying, whoa, that's a Twitter account I didn't expect to see again. And Morgan Webb, I love Morgan Webb. Uh, Morgan Webb commented, I'm just impressed someone remembered the password to the Twitter. <laughs> Morgan Webb is one of my faves. Um, yeah, what do we think about this? I, my wife and I were surfing through. Again, social distancing. We, we like, we, we've been kind of starved for sports, right? So MLB just kicked up and like, we're baseball fans. Kind of interesting watching baseball. S makes me super anxious. But who is it? The Marlins, I think, just had to cancel a game because basically their entire roster is is facing um, a, a situation um, internally where I like they're all infected, I guess. Um, so they had to sit out a game and they might not be back <laughs> for the rest of the season. Again, it kind of depends on how serious it is. And so we're, we're surfing through the channels and a Fortnite tournament was on one of like the ESPNs, right? And this is like, could not be better timing. Esports were already gaining more respect in, in Western pop culture. Like they've already been huge in, 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 in different regions throughout the Pacific, but like they were, we were starting to take them more seriously here in the United States. Now would be the right time, like a shot in the arm for a cable package style television show that gets back into gaming culture. But I, I just like, I fear like, is this really going to be G4 TV? Like the evolution of screensavers and um, again, uh, X play shows like that. Or is it just going to be like tired hack pop culture, trendy references with pretty people dressing up as their favorite Star Wars characters and then endless reruns of Star Trek The Next Generation and maybe a wrestling show. You know, if it's that G4, I'm not interested. But if, I don't know, like if Patrick Norton could find his way back on TV, I'm there. I mean, like, sign me up. I'm down. Um, uh, that would make me really happy. Um, <laughs> from Kane's 047. Heck yeah, I saw a commercial for it. Um... Simon says, Hypno, I like that article just for the writer's name. Todd Spangler for the win. Fat Produce, most extreme elimination challenge comes back on G4 TV. I'll be happy. <laughs> um, uh, Abhishek G85, man, I used to be subscribed to so many G4 TV video podcasts long ago. Used to watch them on my daily college commute on my 120 gig iPod classic. Ah, oh, it just it makes me so happy. Like this used to be such nerd core content. And and like, I, I miss that. I miss that transition. Like, and especially when G4 fell apart, 
and we got like Revision Three and uh, Blit TV, and and there was this this like wild west of of video and podcasting, and you know I was doing a movie review show, like it it was really good times. Um, from Punchcon, I think there's enough news in gaming and tech if they can combine it with some esports that they they could have enough content. I just hope it's not normal TV only. I I, I feel like. I think there's an interesting back and forth that could happen. You know, we're, we're looking, we're still trying to feel out what, what is audience engagement and what do ratings mean in an online environment and how do people interact with content? And I feel like there's something there. Again, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying I believe that the folks who want to resurrect G4 TV um, are, are doing it with these types of like, more noble aspirations but I, again i'm surfing through and i'm seeing fortnite competitions and you're like okay so, some something is happening where we can expand on this conversation and we can make interesting content and commentary and the audience has has changed enough over this time that i think they'll follow us on something that might be a bit more experimental not saying g4 tv will be experimental but someone out there could do something disruptive and have a TV component to that. And I think that would make sense. Root Night 5. Pro player commenting on tournament games would be a great idea. Um, from Ron Connons. I, uh, <laughs> Ronald just wants everyone to know that he finally finished his Battletech campaign. And we're all very proud of him. <laughs> um <laughs> from Steve Q3 Becker. I like the meme that goes 2019 esports is not a sports. 2020 esports is the only sports. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I have been so crazy invested in German soccer. That is a sport. <laughs> Cuz Simon says if no, you know it's serious when even the tough guys of Eurovision refuse to compete. <laughs> All right, let's knock out a quick plug for the subreddit. Every podcast has a subreddit. Mine is no exception. I got to take a drink of water. Ah. Some subreddits are all about news and clips. Some subreddits are just cool places to hang out. Mine is in continuing a conversation where we need to support our favorite content creators. YouTube ain't making it easy. Uh, Facebook is a totally rigged system against people being able to access their audience. There are all these like middle managers that get in the way uh, between you and the people who might watch your content. And so we need to take it on ourselves to support people uh, if we like the content they make. So I created this subreddit, subreddit. The me subreddit is really about trying to find new voices in tech, voices to promote in tech, and new content that we think is gonna be exciting to share. So if you go to reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles, you'll probably find content creators you've never seen before. Again, these are not channels or blogs that are gonna show up on Google or show up on YouTube with the same type of regularity that they try to promote the most popular creators in our space. And I'm now on a two week winning streak. Someone gotta take me down because my Velvet review, top of the charts, A number one, Velvet, the mid-range 5G all-rounder. I win again. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I gotta be careful because it's like, I don't want you to downvote my stuff so other people might win. That's not the spirit of glowing rectangles, but it's not always the foregone conclusion that my own content wins on my subreddit. But I'm now two weeks in a row. I don't know that I have a major review coming out and Nord content is climbing fast. So the second place finish, Josh Vergara. Absolutely deserved. Love his content. One of the more thoughtful creators in our space. A first impressions video and also looking at the OnePlus Buds. Um, that's our number two. And then immediately, a, a really close number three, LG Tone Free FN6 True Wireless Earbuds, the full review from LFA Reviews. LFA Reviews. Again, uh, a creator where if you absolutely despise your ears, like you hate being able to hear pretty sounds 
and you wish you were deaf or that you had um, aggressively horrible audio hallucinatory tinnitus. Um, if that's what you like, you really just, oh, man, I can't stand good music and I really hate listening to things. You should not follow LFA reviews. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that he put out his video because there's a lot that I'm, I'm going to agree with him on because I finally got a little pair of the LG Tone Free also. I kind of wish they didn't show up in white. But look at that cute little blue glow. If you needed blue glowy lights in your um, in your earbud case, then these get an immediate recommend. There, there's some interesting pros and cons to talk about. But again, if you're talking true wireless, LFA Reviews is the is one of the channels to to follow. Um, <laughs> Matt Tyler, I'm downvoting all of Juan's videos this next week. Rounding out the rest of the top stories this week. Is the OnePlus Nord special from Gadget Byte? I just so much enjoy Gadget Byte's style, and it's been exciting that since I've been following Gadget Byte, I want to say over the last year and a half, they've blown up by like 150,000 subscribers. The channel is just so quality. Um, Speed Test G, looking at an ROG3 versus an iPhone SE, with a special shout out to Matt Tyler because Matt Tyler loves his ROG2. But looking at the the performance difference between a, an Apple A13 Bionic and uh, a, the Qualcomm Snapdragon 865 Plus, again, much to the chagrin of creators, uh, of gadget commentators, I should say, like uh, Greg. Greg's gadgets uh, can't seem to wrap his feelings around the actual facts of how chipsets can outperform each other. Because he's out there like, oh, Apple A13, Apple A13. And you're like, well, yeah, but it's not hard to find data where the A13 is outperformed. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> another regular feature, uh, Gary explains, talking about Windows 10 on a Raspberry Pi. Um, the unpopular opinion from Munchie, OnePlus Nord is overhyped and possibly overpriced. And then rounding out our top picks, uh, we've got the Jabra Elite 75T, a, a look back at some great earbuds. And of course, our, our local hometown favorites, the Across the Pond cast with Sam and Matt featuring Josh Vergara. I saved my upvote just for the podcast to click it right there. Great conversation. Um, Sam and Matt, such a fun chemistry, such a fun dynamic. And then to add the guests that they've been talking to into the mix, Josh is always again like to talk food and tea and culture and gadget reviewing. He's just such a, a good guy to listen to, to talk to. Um, I, I can't say enough nice things. And that's a wonderful conversation with those three. Uh, this week, they just recently had uh, um, Issa. Um, Issa was on my podcast a couple weeks back and, and uh, they followed up with another fantastic conversation with Issa. Again, we should be celebrating some different perspectives for how we cover um, tech and, and conversations about technology. If you share some of those concerns that maybe the tech landscape has gotten too top heavy, that a handful of the absolute most popular creators seem to feed the opinion for smaller and mid-tier channels, and that you'd like to break that up a little bit more, you need to be an active participant in sharing the content you enjoy. It's not enough to watch a video and kind of shrug and go, oh, that was cool. I hope they make another. That's not really what fuels um, a, a good gadget conversation. I don't make my videos to just tell you what to think. I make videos because I like having conversations about this stuff, and it's why I'm so aggressively uh, twitchy in my comments on the videos that I produce. It's because I wanted to make a forum post and have sort of a, an open forum conversation. It's not my video is the final word on this gadget. So <laughs> Simon says, Hypno, sweary Josh was great. Such a foul mouth. <laughs> it was so cute because he realized like, I mean, how, I don't know how far into it, but he was like, wait a minute, I can swear on this podcast? I'm totally going to swear on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it was adorable especially for someone so like kind spoken again josh has just that, that very considered and he's you know, like so so kind in his worldview that and he was like um poop <laughs> <laughs> 
it's so sweet. Um, so again, the, my plea is always if, if there's content out there that you're producing that you're you're trying to get a jump start on, if it's blogs, if it's videos, if there's just a creator you think deserves more attention, we can't leave it up to algorithms. Algorithms destroy any content that doesn't land within a very narrow field of popularity. And Issa had some great stuff to talk about this too. She, Issa just recently put out a, a really great look at a, a cordless vacuum. That video is going to get wrecked by YouTube, but it still took effort. She still produced with style. It's engaging commentary. She's fun to listen to. So even if it's not necessarily something that's immediately in your wheelhouse, we lose the vibrance of tech commentary if we let YouTube tell us what's popular. It's not true. It's totally gamed. The system is rigged. <laughs> as I, as I uh, share this and stream this podcast to you on Twitch. Um, another major antitrust corporation that's being investigated. So uh, reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles was my attempt at trying to help break that up. Above all else, engaged participation matters liking, commenting, but most of all, sharing content you enjoy. You cannot be shy if you hope these creators will continue making cool stuff. Reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles is one resource I hope you check out. We've been growing leaps and bounds. We, we picked up like another 30 subscribers to the subreddit this last week. Um, it's just been really exciting to see this, this kind of um, feeder subreddit start building a little popularity on its own. And, and I have to send a special shout out. There's a, a gentleman um, on Twitter, Saeed Tech, uh, Saeed Ted, Saeed Tech. I need to look up what his Twitter handle is, but he also makes some YouTube content too. Uh, Ted Talks, which is kind of cute. Um, I don't know, it's, they're not Ted Talks, but his name is Ted and he talks about tech. Um, he's been doing nightly recaps. You know, just like, oh, the top uh, top upvoted uh, story was this video. And, you know, you get to see what people are commenting on every day. So he's definitely worth a follow on Twitter also. But, yes, um, you have to get out there and support some type of participation or support or this stuff becomes a lot less interesting. And then we all kind of just share the same opinions because that's the only opinion to have is the popular opinion, which is going to pay out better for YouTube. And we can do better than that. Um, one more time, reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles and tell them Juan sent you because when you tell them that Juan sent you, I'm the main moderator. So I'll see that I sent you to me. I think that's fun. <laughs> From dank Pikmin, God was here glowing rectangles and engagement. Two words I never thought I would hear together. It's a major talking point that I... I kind of vomit on about with uh, on my podcast. So we've got um, a, a couple gadget block stories here. This one's going to be uh, each of these is probably going to take a little time just to chew through a bit. But uh, one of the major ones, a uh, piece of news that broke, what was that, about four days ago? Uh, some some not super great news coming out of Intel. Um. Let me screen share this here. Intel's seven nanometer CPUs are delayed and won't arrive until at least 2022 and maybe not until 2023. Uh, this is coming by Engadget, written up by Richard Lawler. Intel delivered bad news to its investors today, announcing that its plans for seven nanometer chips have slipped another six months and yields are now planning are now running a year behind original projections from Intel's PDF. Intel is, is accelerating its transition to 10 nanometer products this year with increasing volumes and strong demand for an expanding lineup. This includes a growing portfolio of 10 nanometer based Intel core processors with Tiger Lake launching soon and the first 10 nanometer based server CPU Ice Lake, which remains planned for the end of this year. In the second half of 2021, Intel expects to deliver a new line of client CPUs codenamed Alder Lake which will include its first 10 nanometer based desktop CPU and 10 nanometer based server CPU Sapphire Rapids. The company's seven nanometer based CPU product timing is shifting approximately six months relative to prior expectations. 
the primary driver is the yield of Intel 7 nanometer process, which based on recent data is now trending approximately 12 months behind the company's internal target. This is rough. I and mean, if you caught this news when it, when it kind of first blasted out and hit the web, there were little indications in this investor call that like you could construe to, to mean like Intel might be examining an exit strategy away from desktop chips. <laughs> like the, the news hit that hard and was that aggressively bad. Um, uh, from Root Night 5, Intel is so screwed next year, it's almost sad. Um, and, and from Kane's 047, you got to hurry up. Other companies are ahead of the curve. Um, Alice Bockley, from hero to zero in a couple of years. Wow, Intel. This timing is so rough. So we, we look at the the CPU market. And, and again, some of this might be a bit rudimentary for those of you in my live chat, especially I'm sure you're, you're probably a bit more well-versed on um, CPU architecture and design. But we are looking at, again, I can't say it's catastrophic. You know, Intel as a company doesn't just immediately vanish, right? There's an enormous infrastructure. I still think their company represents like three times the market cap, maybe four times the market cap of AMD. Like they've got tons of resources. And as a humongous technologies company, desktop CPUs are only one component of a huge infrastructure of products and services and solutions. Um, so it's not that Intel just vanishes and it's not like Intel CPUs just disappear. But starting with the enthusiast space and the people who make noise about laptops and desktops and gaming machines and sort of the, the, um, the higher uh, tier, that mind share of, of professional grade and um, enthusiast, high-end enthusiast desktop, um, HEDT, um, that information starts to trickle out. AMD becomes a bit more competitive in this space. It's just fascinating to see how Intel missed their predictions on what the future of chipset design was going to be. At the worst possible time for AMD, at the worst possible time for Intel, that AMD was making such a significant pivot in their chip chiplet design. So uh, I, I feel like a major component of this is taking it back to the, the heyday of the core processor, just as uh, AMD and Phenom and Bulldozer are starting to struggle to meet price performance. You know, like you're making an enthusiast PC, you could save money here with an AMD, but you're probably, it's probably worth it to spend the extra 20 bucks and get the more expensive motherboard and go with an, 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 an Intel build. That... um. When we look at that heyday of the Intel Core processor, we started to see an Intel that got way more incremental about improvements. If they didn't need to uh, revolutionize uh, CPU performance every generation, you know, a smaller upgrade here, a smaller update there, more incremental, just tinier baby steps for this TikTok approach that Intel's already had. I really feel the danger point came when we started hearing about those security um, risks built into x86 architecture. Intel had been so focused on speed that they constructed their chips in ways that made external attacks uh, much more significant, like access to information and uh, just really, really ugly stuff. And then we saw an Intel that had to pivot from their CPU designs to start addressing some of the problems in their manufacturing and to improve on these security issues. And that's also the same time that AMD took a look at their, their chips and they decided, hey, instead of making this one big chip, what goes real fast and has four cores, what if we made these little mini cores and we stitched them together with some, some, uh, some fancy engineering? And that radically improved AMD's yield, how many chips you can make that are actually viable. I mean, you get this big piece of silicon, you, you, you carve up all the little pieces of it, and some of those chips work great, some of those chips work okay, and some of those chips don't work at all. 
But when you make tiny little chiplets and then you put those little chiplets on, on another uh, die, on another surface, then you can more aggressively manufacture more cores and have a higher yield. So Intel already pivoting from their, probably their original two to three year timeline on chip design, having to address performance, also making these big monolithic processors and AMD attacking in a completely different way. And then we get to ARM. So now we know that, it, uh, that Apple is gonna be taking ARM references from their A13 and A series processors to start making the CPUs in their laptops and, and eventually in their desktops. And they're making that transition probably largely because of Intel's roadmap that Intel can't keep Apple fed and satisfied with high performance chips that don't require a ton of cooling because we know Apple is not good at designing cooling um, and, and migrating that into next generation performance. This is like the worst of all worlds for Intel to eventually arrive at a timeline where these smaller fabrications, when we talk about nanometers, you know, Intel has been on 14 nanometer for a while. They're looking at a rollout for 10 nanometer. Their seven nanometer process has been delayed. Um, the smaller you go, the better you can improve performance, the faster these chips can operate, thermals go down, power, power goes down. It, it's, it's a benefit. It's not the only aspect. I mean, you can say like, oh, well, AMD's on 10 nano and they're going to be at 7 nano. Well, chiplet design is a very different architecture than Intel's monolithic design. So there are some pros and cons. It's not to say the smaller fabrication always wins, but it helps a lot. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to overlook the sophistication of these, these different, these competing solutions that both operate in the x86 landscape. But then ARM is going to come in and if you want low power, like, you know, low sipping battery power, but, you know, high performance, active cooling on an ARM chipset, the same thing that goes into your phone could be amazingly disruptive to the laptop market. So, um, again, it, it, it's just, we, we kind of knew that there were some issues in Intel land, um, but, uh, to, to have them disclose it and detail it during an earnings call like this is just rough. It's rough position. And uh, I don't know. I mean, like, I'm, I'm wrapping up a, a, a negligent video. I, I, I spent a lot of time tinkering with um, that uh, Ghost Canyon Nook. Um, it's an Intel little tiny small form factor PC. I thought I killed it. Uh, the graphics card that I borrowed from Newegg, it was a 10, 1070 ITX graphics card. I didn't know that the Newegg Ninjas had kind of tinkered with the uh, the fan on it and hadn't really put it back together correctly for one of their build videos. And so I was running that thing pretty hard and then it kind of went sizzle pop. <laughs> <laughs> and thankfully it was just the GPU. Um, but I have a, a 1660 Super in there now. So it's this tiny little box, um, not quite mini ITX, but definitely smaller than micro ATX. It's taken me so long to get back on track to talk about that. But, you, you know, again, that this is one of those things where Intel's products and offerings and strategies, the long-term roadmap in my head that made sense for Intel is now totally scrapped. And it's so, it's so interesting to see like where they might go. But now we've got pretty good data that like these expectations that Intel would maybe come out swinging in 2021, they're facing... Um, a substantial lead from AMD. At the same time, they're going to have to start fighting Apple on their own in-house chip design. That is scary territory. I have no idea what that Intel looks like by the end of 2023. We could be looking at the beginnings of an IBM style transition for Intel, where they have to start migrating services and product lines and development to something totally different. It, it's, it's, it's freaky stuff. It's, I, I don't know. I, I like, I get anxious, but I also kind of get like weird, sick, excited because these types of, of um, transition points in the world of technology are the things that we'll look back on. You know, wh wh you watch a documentary about like Compaq, 
way back in the day and how they took on IBM and they made a portable and and IBM had these stodgy desktops and they had John and Compaq had John Cleese in their commercials. And it was such an inflection point. You didn't know it when you were living through it, what the ramifications for the tech industry were going to be. And it and here we know we know we're at the beginnings of something <laughs> happening with Intel. And it's nuts. Huh. Oh, and Leonidas saying, uh, great LG content on your channel. Mr. Homebrew in the building. Thanks so much for, for watching my videos and reviews. Um, Ron, O'Connell, Ron O'Collins, I used to have a Q6600 quad core, and I also had an i7-920 CPU, the Extreme Series X99 motherboard tri- with the tri-channel memory interface. Um, I, I stopped, I got off Intel on the 5820K. Um, I had a 58, uh, 5820, and that was a, a, a decent near server grade um, CPU. It, it's just, again, it's been, it's been interesting. Like for example, right now, if you were building a gaming PC, Intel still makes a pretty strong argument. Your, your, your power level, your thermals are gonna be higher, but if you're looking at the absolute fastest, especially in like single core performance, but fastest uh, you know, chip, to make game run better, you could you can make an argument for uh, a tenth tenth gen. I can't say that very easily. Tenth gen uh, Intel CPU, but if you want a box that kind of does more of everything, AMD's chiplet design is really tough to beat on all fronts. It's going to lose for one gaming specific benchmark, and then it's going to kind of win for everything else. <laughs> Dave Burns, man, I just want good CPUs for my overcompensation computer. It is so funny. Like, um, I'm still uh, struggling a little bit with some motherboard issues on this Threadripper that I'm currently streaming on. And even with it not running as optimally as I would want it to, I have not maxed out this box yet. Um, I was making a joke on the Discord where I was transcoding a video while playing a game. And just like, just because I can. (laughs) It's like completely ridiculous uh overcompensation (laughs) to follow dave burns there (sighs) and dave burns yeah threadripper motherboards are a proper mess i'm really hoping this next gen uh zen is able to uh to clean some of that up who wants to talk more about gaming anyone anyone want to talk about gaming because uh we um I mean, we can talk about Intel CPUs for gaming, but Microsoft, they do gaming stuff. And they put out a showcase with a ton of games. I mean, maybe not the strongest uh, advertisement for an actual Xbox, but but lots of games. I mean, Aditi Anil wants to talk about gaming because he plays Sudoku every day. That's a game. Um, I'm currently screen sharing. Sorry for those of you listening to the audio version of this podcast. Um, we got uh, some uh, an early look at Halo Infinite. And lots of jokes about the uh, the quality of next gen graphics. We got State of Decay. Um, State of Decay actually got a, a, a chuckle out of me. Um, State of Decay Three is going to be sort of like a, a zombie romp kind of a game, but uh, you know we we like to make that joke in gaming and in film critique and movie critique, you know, thanks to dudes like Ryan Johnson working on star Wars, you know, expectations subverted. It's this woman, she's got a crossbow and she's trekking through the woods. She's got it. Got, you know, she looks through the scope. She sees this wolf on the ground and it's getting like, it's all bloody and torn up. And then she pans up her scope, her, her, her scope. And she sees a zombie deer eating the wolf. Whoa! I guffawed at that reveal. It's not often that I mean, like, something really genuinely takes me by surprise in in a way that I think, like, I don't think that was the effect they were going for. But in the middle of this Microsoft Games roundup, and we're talking about games, and this is intense, and the buildup, and the and the anticipation, and the suspense, we finally pan it up. Zombie deer. <laughs> I don't think I've laughed that hard in months. It was just like the perfect 
Womp womp. <laughs> I mean, again, the game looks like it could be kind of cool. I, I, I still loves me some zombie media. Zombie deer got legit crack up. I, I, I chuckled hard while watching that that uh, that reveal. But um, from Abhishek, uh, I'm not super into racing games, but every generation of Forza, uh, Forza Motor Motorsports, we got some uh, some some preview scenes on that. Um, it always makes me wish I were more into racing games. Forza is just such a pretty game. So even just adding a little graphics eye candy on top of a series of games that have always been gorgeous. It, like I might play it a little. I, I always suck at them and I get frustrated with them pretty fast. Um, Everwild uh, got some uh, some interesting reactions while we were streaming. I don't think anyone really commented much on um, Tell Me Why, which is a game uh, following in the footsteps of Life is Strange, a cinematic mystery about two siblings. Um, Ori and the Will of the Wisps um, looks gorgeous. Um, a new version of the game is coming out for Xbox Series X, which runs at 120 frames per second. Um, and uh, it will also run in 4K with ray tracing. And Ori is already a pretty game. That looks like it's going to be absolutely stunning. Um, we got a word on Outer Worlds. Uh, Grounded, uh, sort of a Honey, I Shrunk the Fortnite game, I guess is what it might be. Um, it looks like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, but it... Uh, th was, this, was Grounded the one where they had the whole teaser about uh, cyberpunk? Someone remind me. One of the games that listed had one of the most brilliant trailers. If you're looking for the biggest game of 2020, wait for Cyberpunk. <laughs> Bobby Newport. Um, but yeah. So tons and tons and tons and tons of games. Avowed uh, looked kind of interesting. Uh, As Dusk Falls. Psychonauts. Uh, Destiny 2 made an announcement that it's going to be on um, on the new series of Xboxes. But one of the things that was kind of interesting is, is we're... Oh, and Medium. Uh, the dual reality of uh, the Medium. Which, again, a sort of fantasy exploration combat. If, if you played Control, you know, I, I feel like we're going to see a whole series of, of fantasy sci-fi type titles. And Medium kind of gave me a little sense of that. Some interesting play mechanics where... Our world isn't what it seems to be, and you kind of pass through this dimensional force. Um, DT and Il, yeah, Grounded was the one that started off with the cyberpunk tease. I like it when a game developer is self-aware, and and cyberpunk even tweeted back like, "Hey, we see you." <laughs> but um, yeah, so you know, there was news about Fable, and again, we can leave it to Microsoft to talk about like next generation gaming and next generation graphics and 4k 60 frame per second gaming and then show off all of this stuff in a youtube live stream there was nothing about this showcase where it needed to be streamed live but they streamed it live which meant it was stuttering like crazy i i regularly saw like the quality dip out of 1080p <laughs> when they're talking about 4k gaming um it was like they were really going out of their way to not let you see how pretty these games might have been. <laughs> but but throughout all of this, and one of the things that I kind of wanted to bring up, especially with folks here in the live chat, um, I was, I was kind of um, peeking in on Viper's stream with um, uh, uh, For the Love of Tech. For the Love of Tech? No. Tech Lover? I can't remember now. It was someone does a lot of really great camera stuff ben dang it i can't remember his youtube channel anyway um anyway they, they got on the top of gaming and you know, microsoft has been making a lot of claims about xbox is going to be more powerful but there's going to be sort of a more streamlined version of xbox it's not going to be as powerful and it really seems to me that microsoft is already pivoting on this next generation of console. Um, so much of this Xbox games showcase, you know, all of these titles coming in and so many of them saying like, oh, well, this is going to be Game Pass and this is going to be available on Xbox and PC. And then they they kind of let their strategy, um, they, they detailed more of their strategy saying, 
so many of their next generation titles will also be backwards compatible on current Xbox hardware. So it takes a lot of the pressure off. If you're an Xbox gamer and you're interested in, in, in some of these games, they're not, they're not forcing a console upgrade for some of these as exclusives. It's, it's more Xbox is a service, is a platform of gaming, and there's a lot of forwards and backwards compatibility um, kind of built into this equation. So, um, and yeah, Ben, lover of tech. He's a good dude. He's on the show this Sunday. Oh, great. <laughs> so I, I, I'm kind of being obnoxious. I like to be a little fly in, in the live chat comments on other people's streams. And it's, it's not a good look, but I own it. It's who I am. Um, so I, I, I kind of chime in, you know, like, I don't think it's too difficult to see a strategy emerging here where I think we can be pretty confident if if the metric is who wins based on the number of boxes sold, I'm pretty confident Sony is going to take this this next generation of consoles. Like I don't think that's a controversial statement. Like I don't think he's I, I don't think I'm saying anything radical or shocking there. But what we've seen from Microsoft since the um, the launch of our this last generation Xbox to this next generation Xbox is trying to move the gaming industry more aggressively on software and services. I mean, let's let's not forget when the Xbox One X, yeah, um, when we started getting word on that, how many gamers freaked out about things like, well, it needs an always on data connection. And you're like, oh, Microsoft is trying to uh, control my games and uh, Steam is evil and, oh, no, gamers. And and now, like, these are sort of basically just industry practices that we all take for granted now on how, on, on how gaming should work. i kind of getting the same sense here. Like, I kind of feel as long as you can display a 4K image out of one of these boxes – that Microsoft's end game is by the end of this next console generation. In five to eight years, Microsoft gaming is going to be a ubiquitous cloud service that follows you anywhere. We have a ton of infrastructure and data to work out. Not every consumer is going to be able to jump on board. But you you pick up Game Pass and then they build in the price of X cloud. And you have the true Netflix of gaming, both the catalog of content and the distribution of that content cloud only. And so you you end up with this service. You know, again, like you play your game anywhere. You want to play it on a phone. You want to play it on a Chromebook. You want to play it in a browser. You want to play it on a desktop. You want to play it on a TV. We don't care. But it kind of makes sense if they have a lower power Xbox Series X oh, well, this box locally can only do 1080p gaming. I mean, you you save some money. But if you'd want to stream the game, well, it's like a Trojan horse. You already have the box connected to your TV, and maybe you saved 100 bucks. 100 bucks could get you a game or two or a couple months of Game Pass. And you know, now that you're paying for Game Pass, wouldn't you want to try a, a stream of this game? And so I, I was just a little disappointed. I think there's something interesting about that strategy is, again, it's if you can't just beat Sony head to head with making more and more and more powerful living room computers, how do you how do you end run around Sony is you make the box under your TV less relevant. You make it less a part of the mandatory living room experience and you position software and services where Microsoft is one of the top options. You know, they can turn they can point dozens of servers and data centers around the country hundreds of of you know computing units thousands and uh, this infrastructure is enormous for powering the internet and then you use that hardware to fulfill gameplay at a nominal monthly subscription fee and i think like you know we mock stuff like stadia but stadia was a really good demo google just doesn't have the gaming infrastructure to really pull off stadia as a console I don't, I don't believe they've got that, but they showed the proof of concept where I was playing Attack on Titan um, on a Pixel 3a and it played great 
and I was on a pretty mediocre data connection. So it's not off the pulse. It's it's not beyond the pale. But again, it's it's like right now, tech commentary and our tech geeks are really fixated on what is what is the tech of today, and that's all we can imagine for the tech of tomorrow. You know, we 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 recently talked about new video compression H.266. Uh, latency is always brought up, but latency could actually improve for tournament style play if everyone's connecting to the same server. Like if you're actually playing the game on the same server and you only have to stream a video feed, that could actually be better in some instances than locally rendering and powering the game and then streaming out to some unified server that coordinates all of these other computers that are rendering at different frame rates and and rendering different environments and different graphic states and then communicating player position in that space. You know, again, if you're a geek with some imagination, in eight years, when this next console generation is is on its uh, is sort of sunsetting and we're sort of ending it, we should want to have some type of different gameplay option in this space. And that's where the beginnings of something like Xbox as a service and Game Pass and X Cloud make tons of sense to me. This isn't the, how does Microsoft win the console generation? It's how does Microsoft make the console, gen the, the console wars obsolete in five to eight years? So I don't know anyone else that can really do it. Nintendo doesn't have that kind of infrastructure. Sony doesn't roll their own servers. So I'm sure through PlayStation Network, they could piggyback on someone else's infrastructure, but then they'd always be beholden to those data rates where Microsoft can basically undercut everyone to host their own server content. You know, we end up with a situation where Sony would probably have to pay Microsoft to catch up to that kind of infrastructure just to lease time on those servers or go and do business with Amazon or with Google. And Google is trying, I don't know how, you know, how aggressively they're still trying, but Google tried to do Stadia. It, it's, it's fascinating back and forth where what we take for granted as I need a box, what lives under my TV, and I have a controller and that's how I game is very quickly showing the end of that run. The, the tenure of that idea is starting not like i'm not saying that xbox launches and immediately everyone just goes to game streaming but we're starting that conversation uh, nvidia wants to be a part of that market i would love for steam to give me something like that i'd pay 20 bucks a month for steam in in, in exactly the same business model as stadia i'd pay maybe 10 15 20 somewhere in that ballpark where my entire Steam catalog is accessible no matter where I game. That would be cool with me. If I want to game in the absolute highest quality, fidelity, audio, my, you know, my little battle station here, I still have a killer PC. I can do that. But, you know, if I'm out at a job site and I have a little Chromebook and I bring like a, my Steel Series Bluetooth controller, why not? Why not? Why not make some progress and then all of my progress is cloud saved on Steam servers? I'd pay for that. Of course I'd pay for that. Who wouldn't? <laughs> like, who's really into gaming? I'd want access to my Steam catalog everywhere I go and not have to run the game locally here on this PC and then try and connect to it remotely. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> DTNL. Microsoft also has an end game. The mouse is going to be ready to sue. Um, from Sentinel 909, I hate, 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 hate not actually owning any of my games and let's not get started on, um, I can't play my single player game if I'm not online. There's definitely some obnoxious trends with always on data connections. But that was another thing too. It was like someone brought up like, well, if you play Fortnite, you can't have any lag. Like, yeah, but what if I want to play Gears of War and I just want to do the single player campaign? Will an extra millisecond of lag matter there? And Stadia demonstrated we have broadband infrastructure issues, but you know, on a mediocre connection, I could not detect any lag that would have fallen outside 
like Bluetooth controller. <laughs> like it was fine. Um, Dave Burns, the Xbox One started off as this, but was far too early. Plus the broadband infrastructure is still really bad in the US. So we might get left behind. And, and I think that's also the play. Um, I think Google and Microsoft and Sony and NVIDIA, they're all tired of waiting for ISPs. So you start putting out the services and that kicks the butt of ISPs to start upping their game and improving their connectivity. If we wait for more ISPs to improve connectivity, that's never going to happen. Customers won't want more bandwidth if they don't have the services to use it with. And I think a perfect example is something like Netflix. People cared about getting higher quality video streaming on a platform like that. And we're not, this isn't that dissimilar from, from gaming. Pushing into this territory means you've got to, the game companies have to take the step first. If you wait, we'll, we'll wait forever. And that's why I think I get so frustrated with geeks is like, well, it's not immediately perfect and it's not going to do this and it's not going to do that and it's not going to make me ham sandwiches. So it's not good enough. And you're like, you, you've got to take the step first though. You, you can sit from the sidelines and be a naysayer and not participate and not contribute and just talk trash about Stadia. Fine. But you're completely missing the larger picture of how do we get this stuff to evolve? Because if you just sit back and do nothing, you get nothing. <laughs> Matt Tyler, I love Project X Cloud. Pair my DualShock 4 to the ROG 2 and just play games. Halo at the moment is great. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. From Dave Burns Tube, Sony does use Azure servers, ironically enough. So they've already been partnership with Microsoft there. Uh, from Root Night 5, Nintendo wants to profit off their consoles and games so they don't have the business model to aim for making consoles obsolete. Once that happens, Nintendo will likely switch to the mobile market. I bet you Nintendo's catalog would be really attractive to someone on a subscription style service. The licensing gets real twitchy with some of those older like Capcom titles and stuff, but I bet you Nintendo could make a pretty good play for... Here's a $10 a month Nintendo subscription, and you can play anything. You can play it in a browser because you could load an, an NES ROM in your browser right now. Like, you can already do that. Um, you know, phones are plenty powerful enough to keep up with a huge chunk of their catalog. But, again, I'd, I'd maybe be curious if, if I could do that more cost-effectively than buying, like, I've got an SNES Mini over on my TV over there. Oh, Dave Burns in a DTNL, RIP Steam Machines. Uh, again, building a computer to do that, I think was a good idea. They just didn't have the infrastructure to make the argument for why you needed a Steam Machine more than just building a regular PC. But um, if Steam went server side, that could be, that could be awesome. I, again, there's no indication that they're even examining this. I just feel like they've got an infrastructure and a customer base and a catalog. And you're already used to buying games on your Steam summer sale. I, they, they could make it happen. Uh, um, and people talking about, uh, you know, Nintendo and Switches and Switches are stupid profitable, of course. Of course, you know, like, again, uh, Nintendo's business model is is wholly unique to Nintendo. But that's also why this fight between PC gaming, Xbox, and PlayStation is going to be so critical. The entire future of our, like, infrastructure and our uh, um, entertainment, it's, it's internet-based. If this global uh, social distancing experiment has shown us anything, it's that we all need to be fighting for better connectivity and better services and better software and streaming. And unfortunately, we'll have to take a few early hits for those of us who enjoy playing with xCloud and with Stadia. Um, we're going to have to get our hearts broken. But if we don't actually show up to use these services and then comment on how to improve these services, then we get nothing. We, we get no progress. So uh, moving right along. I want to wrap this up. Our podcast is going to go long, but I just had to, um, 
I, I, we, we have to talk about a really exciting development in material science, which I'm, let, let's just get this out of the way right now. I am not qualified to talk about material sci sciences, um, but I, I took, um, the, the news broke, sorry, burying the lead, Corning. They make Gorilla Glass. We've seen these iterations of Gorilla Glass, uh, Gorilla Glass 1 and 2 and 3, and each of them bring somewhat unique properties to the mix. But glass is glass, and glass can break, and glass can scratch, and glass can crack. And I still feel like out of all the materials that we've migrated to to make, um, to make our phones, I'm still not the biggest fan of using glass as the rear casing material. There's, there, I, I need to preface this where I'm about to nerd out hard on what Corning had to show off. But at the same time, I would be very happy to be using vegan leather, uh, wood. Um, I don't know that you could really use carbon fiber, but maybe Kevlar, high quality, you know, a thicker polycarbonate, you know, like not just plastic, but that really nice nice feeling thick plastic. You could sell me a thousand dollar phone with some alternative material. It would not need to be glass and I would be very happy. But this is a turning point as Corning is now, uh, th they've moved to a glass called Victus, uh, which means life. And I'm actually gonna screen share their one of their promo videos here while we talk about this stuff. Um, the, the press releases went out and uh, we saw some some really uh, bold claims. Uh, glass that not is is not only more scratch resistant, but is also more crack and and drop resistant. And it's always funny when you talk to PR PR people. Um, well, we listened to our consumers, and they said they wanted. Uh, glass that is harder to scratch and glass that's harder to break. And you're like, well, yeah. But in material science, this has always been sort of the the magic unicorn statement, right? And so, um, again, we're, we're talking about very specific testing protocols for, for how this glass is is produced and how they, they verify their claims. Um, right now we're looking at a slapper, which sort of swings the phone in an arc and smashes it against uh, concrete. Um, they, they did these drop tests where they took something that weights similar to a phone and they drop it from two meters from over six feet. Um, so if you're over six feet tall and you're, you're talking on your phone and a full front face drop on a, on a sandpaper covered steel surface and we're seeing much more durable results. Um, even down into uh, some of these situations where once you already have a scratch on your screen, your phone is significantly more compromised. And so Victus is also supposed to address that. Say you get a scratch on your screen and then pressure is applied, um, your, your phone should survive better too. So, so this makes for you know, like really fun, just sort of uh, gadget destruction porn you know, where we're looking at um, some of these marketing claims and and uh, I, I have a healthy skepticism, right? You, you If you make something more scratch resistant in the past, that means that material has been more brittle. So it actually can kind of crack easier. And we sort of ran into some of those issues with exotic materials like um, sapphire displays. Uh, I, I, I still have, I have um, a Kyocera Brigadier with the Sapphire screen where I've got a video and I'm raking concrete over that screen and it comes out pristine as concrete is crumbling over that device. But the flip side is if you make something more drop or shock resistant, it's usually a softer material. So this is actually kind of a big deal in glass and in, in material science that for this alum, aluminous, aluminous, I can't say that, aluminosilicate. That's about as close as I can get. I don't think that's actually how you pronounce that word. But this this chemically treated ion ion dense glass is that Corning is is claiming they've managed to do both. So I took a conference call. Um, they did a whole PR tour, and they even called me up <laughs> of all people. Um, so I took a conference call, and they did some of those tests, like the slapper test that I just showed. Um, and it's 
it's pretty remarkable seeing something like this demoed in real time where, uh, you know, this is, uh, I, I forget exactly how tall this arm is, but it, but it basically sim simulates a direct forceful impact from something that would have been like a six foot drop. And there's a little plate um, of, of sandpaper covered steel that the glass just slams immediately into. And it was actually kind of cute too, because the person who was doing the presentation, they had one of those like auto vlogging cameras that would follow him. And so he would walk away from the slapper because it was really loud. And then the camera would follow him and you hear, well, crack. And then you'd cut back. And you're like, uh, guys, camera cut away from the slapper. So you might want to run that demo again because I didn't see anything. And so he'd just do it again. The guy running the demo like just looked so over it, but it was hilarious. He'd be like, okay, cool. Wink, whoop, crack. <laughs> And so he hit this piece of glass like four times because the presenter would keep walking away from the camera and they didn't have the time to like swap out samples to like, you know, pull like a bait and switch. Um, and it survived like every single time. And, and they demoed like what the pucks look like for some of this material testing. And I don't know. I, I, I've got some press photos here. So you've probably seen a lot of these, but you know, this is a weighted um, cell phone shaped puck. And they have one where the glass is just sort of a couple micron above, but it's a flat front. And they also have some where it's curved glass to also look at the material science of a uh, glass that warps on the sides. But it, it, it's, it, it's always scary stuff. And yet we might be on the cusp of some nice durability improvements. We'll have to see. I, I, I don't know that we're going to see... I don't know that we're going to see a ton of manufacturers jumping on board early next year. Um, I'll be very surprised if whatever follows for the Galaxy S, like a Galaxy S30, if that's what we get next, I'll be very surprised if they don't use Victus. Um, but a number of other manufacturers have been out there making other chemically treated and more durable glass products. What Corning is showing off here is very bold. The claims here are very significant, but the practical demos that they showed off, I couldn't point to anything where, okay, well, that's a claim, but it lacks this context, or you're kind of playing fast and loose with some of your product demo, or, oh, you know what, I, I can see what you're doing there, but in a real world condition, this would this would really be a bigger concern than, than the type of test you're trying to accomplish. Um, it, it seemed pretty legit. Um, even for my sniff detector, um, whether or not, w whether or not something like this might make a bigger, uh, uh, my, my, it, whether something like this might make a bigger impact on, on smartphone durability. Um, this video is not playing. Come on video. But these are the different slappers that they use to do that swing. And just like, you know, when we start talking about the actual force that they hit this glass with. So my um, one of my concerns might be that this glass is 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 so rich in in. Uh, so one of the other things, and again, I'm not as qualified to talk about this as I, as I probably should be. Um, but from reading up on other kinds of chemically treated glass. Remember how we saw Galaxy S20s, the camera modules would look like they kind of exploded. They looked like they kind of got shot. Um, it wasn't just like the camera module would crack. It looked like a part of it just blew up and that there was like a hole in that glass covering the camera module. When we start messing with glass to improve that kind of durability, it gets more scratch resistant. It gets more drop resistant. But when it fails it bursts. It's not just like, you know, one little hairline crack. It's like, it, it almost looks like kind of an explosion of pressure has, has, uh, has popped off. Now what Corning is showing off is an order of magnitude more durable than what we've currently been using on phones. And it's going to be up to manufacturers to also apply the density or the, the, the thickness of this glass and not just kind of play fast and loose with marketing. Like, oh, we're using Victus. And you're like, you're using such a thin plane of Victus that it's it's probably not going to be a consumer benefit. Um, or like, you know, maybe you get a Victus screen protector. That'll that'll totally do it. Um, but but 
their claims are not dependent on frame or on other manufacturing attributes. So it's not that this glass has to be under a certain pressure on a certain kind of frame, and that's what keeps it intact. It's not, there's a special coating that makes it more scratch resistant that will eventually wear off. I mean, there still will be like a nano coating, but that's really more for cleanliness than anything else. Like the actual properties of this glass seem to demonstrate both scratch, scratch resistance and crack, crack resistance. Uh, crack durability but i would i would just be afraid like if you push one of these victus glass devices to its limit and it finally does fail because you can if you try to break a phone you eventually will succeed in breaking that phone um you know will, will this just crack or will it be like that samsung issue where it like it ripples like the 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 crack explodes over the front face of your phone and that's the only concern I have. And it's way out there because, you know, these phones don't exist yet. But it was also really cool. Like, I got to sit down with one of the Corning um, engineers. Well, not sit down. I mean, we were on a, a WebEx conference. But, you know, I'm kind of making some lame jokes about Star Trek Four, And you're like, oh, if you guys are ever going to come up with uh, transparent aluminum. <laughs> um, but in just talking to them, it, it's, it also kind of helped reinforce why I absolutely hate gadget destruction porn videos. Like, oh, we've got an, an iPhone and a Samsung, and we're just going to keep dropping them over and over and over again. Like, you're not proving any durability. Um, so when, when we see that uh, Corning is making these pucks, you know, this is an example of the Corning puck. Um, it, it's weighted and balanced like a phone. It weighs about as much as a phone. There's stuff inside it to kind of simulate having a battery and a, and a circuit board. And then there's a general frame around the outside of it. We're talking thousands of those pucks get dropped and scratched and poked and prodded because if you have one drop, you might have micro fractures in there that you can't see, but that affect the durability of subsequent damage and abuse. And that was one of the more interesting parts of that product demo where they would go through and they would purposely scratch into different types of glass and this new Victus and then apply pressure and you could see how much more readily all of these solutions would fail but that victus even still was better than the competition for that kind of stuff i'm starting to sound like a corning advertisement but again we don't all uh, i personally don't always get that kind of access to pepper questions so like when i say you know, like hey what what does this testing protocol look like and he's like oh yeah so we'll take dozens of these things <laughs> and we'll just do this one type of drop test and like oh well yeah okay that makes a lot more sense <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I'll never forget touring um, an Oppo manufacturing facility and you know they're assembling thousands of phones in this campus and they're just taking samples but dozens of phones every day just get destroyed because they need to make sure that they're that they're breaking within tolerance not just like oh well we know if we drop them a whole bunch they'll break it's like well, what if someone has this phone in a back pocket and their jeans flex this phone? Well, we've got to destroy a dozen phones today just testing that. And that's the reality of like what goes into this type of manufacturing. At that scale, the, the insane number of sacrificed devices and samples, it, it's, it's shocking. It's, it's a really heady concept to wrap your brain around. <laughs> for Matt Tyler, let's hope Qualcomm and Corning charge stupid for next year's stuff because we will see $1,500 and $1,700 phones. Um, Dave Burns, how much will this increase the price of our smartphones? That's one thing I couldn't get a good handle on. I am expecting that phones with Victus are going to come with higher price tags. I, I have to believe that Corning's next generation manufacturing will have an impact, will have an effect on component prices. I don't know what to, to what degree. And again, I, I like for how Corning partners with other companies, I have to believe that the way they negotiate and work out those deals, it's got to be highly secretive and totally proprietary. Um, but, um, you know, I'm hoping that it's rolled into the price of a gadget in a way where 
the Victus brand isn't isn't an immediate twenty dollar price increase all on its own. Like I don't believe that's gonna be the situation. Um, from Q3 Becker, will it blend? I'm pretty confident it will, but you're gonna have to have some torque on that blender. <laughs> Simon says hypno, but how will the Victus glass feel in the hand? I, I, you know, it's just really nice that Corning is working on a solution that isn't just broken shards of palm stabbing agony. You know, it's 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 nice. It feels like you know Victus is going to be designed for an evolved primate grip with an opposable thumb. It's gonna it feels really nice in the hand. Um, Sentinel nine oh nine. That said, Jerry Rig just discovered that the OnePlus Nord has a plastic frame, and is not particularly durable because of it. I get it. You know, the thing about Jerry, like, I really, I, I think I like his teardown videos more than his durability videos. Again, I, I keep coming back to this idea. You know, we saw this with the Pixel 4. If you go out of your way to try and break a gadget, you will succeed. And there are some gadgets that stand up to intentional damage better than others. Um... If you look at a phone like the Pixel and you look at those antenna bands and you purposely try to apply maximum pressure to two flexion points, which are not likely to be impacted in general smartphone use and will be, and that intentional damage will be nullified by a good case, then yes, you have some concerns. I don't know how shocked or surprising we should find it that the Nord at that really crazy low price faces some compromises in build materials. I mean, we always want to be, we always want to be critical of companies and manufacturing claims and price performance and all that stuff. It's, it's not to say that Jerry is that Jerry rigs everything that Zach is, is misrepresenting a, a product or, or, a, 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 you know, a solution like that, but also, was OnePlus ever making a claim that they had a more durable product? You know, LG makes a very bold claim with IP68 rating, and I don't feel they always do a very good job of explaining what 810G shock resistance means. Now, if you pick up the Velvet, I have zero faith in that phone surviving drops, you know, without getting cracked. But if LG says it's 810G drop resistant, then what I believe is that if I damage this phone through dropping it, that I'll still be able to extract information from the internals, that the internals will survive even if the outside casing is cracked and shattered and, and not usable. I have a higher expectation for data survivability than gadget survivability, if that makes sense. But I don't think LG Marketing has ever had that conversation, right? So you say, oh, 810G shock resistant, and people think, oh, well, I can wing it around and I can drop it onto concrete. And that's, I do not believe that's what we should be talking about. So Nord has a plastic frame and it's probably really easy to damage. And were, were we expecting ruggedness or durability? Or do we just make sure that that's a component of anyone who's interested in buying a Nord, you should get a screen protector and a case for it. Your ultra cheap phone came with compromises and now you have to pay to rectify some of those compromises. But at the end of that journey, you're still going to end up with what I think is probably a pretty good deal for the target markets and the demographics who might be interested in a phone like the Nord. I feel like consumers get that, you know, again, it's, you don't see the same proliferation of naked phones out there like we used to see, you know, back when phones were mostly made out of plastic, yeah, it got scratched up and you'd have a cracked screen, but I'm seeing people more and more frequently putting some kind of case on a, on, on a device like that. <laughs> Matt Tyler, screen protector companies just pooped themselves. Ah. <laughs> uh. And Steve, Q3 Becker, it was widely reported that the Nord had a had a plastic frame. Uh, Dave Burns, too. His phone flex is pretty impressive. Um, yeah, it's from JJ. Nokia had high-quality polycarb. iPhone 5C was, was polycarb. Again, it's um, 
Oh, from Root Night 5. To be honest, the Ben test can represent what happens to a phone in a jeans back pocket that is tight enough that I could see a phone bend. Ben test does not do that very well. When when you oh, I need a visual aid. So when you take a phone and you you bend it the way that he's bending it, that is not the same kind of flexion damage that you would see under under stress from cloth. Um, again, I, I I did an Oppo tour where they have machines that have rollers um, and then a fabric covering, and they push up against the fabric in a way that bends the phone. And that's much more realistic for the type of load that covers a broader surface area. And that's why I was a little, I mean, again, you can demonstrate how easily damaged um, the Pixel 4 was. And, but you see, you have to apply very specific pressure to, the, to where those antenna bands are into that weakest point of the frame. Bend tests, I feel, were were gadget porn destruction sensational videos for the iPhone 6. But since then, I think most manufacturers have gotten a pretty good handle on where do we really put our resources and how can we improve the durability of these gadgets? An iPhone 6, especially a, you know, a larger, a 6 Plus, you know, you could put that in a front pocket and crouch and start warping the frame because of how how poor a job Apple did managing like where the volume rocker was. The Pixel 4 snapping, the frame cracking under um, Zach's, you know, bend test there was a very specific and localized application of force at maximum pressure to the weakest part of the phone in a way that I don't feel is very likely. Something to be concerned about, but again, almost immediately nullified by a modest bumper case. And and so when you see like where is he trying to to push? This is not scientific. You 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 end up with, oh, do I feel flex over here? Do I feel flex over here? Where where is it starting to fail? And then I can shift to apply force because human hands are not machines. And and life is messier and dirtier. So I appreciate the sentiment or the idea that like, well, I mean, yeah, your pocket might be shaped differently, so you can't account for all pockets. But the style of flex damage that would happen from cloth is very different than what our hands are going to accomplish with very small points of pressure applying that force in specific places to a phone frame. And then after you you flex to one side, you might have already compromised some of the structural integrity of that gadget. So, you know, like, oh, well, I flex this way with the screen and then I flex this way with the back of the phone. You know, I'm I'm not saying it's impossible and I'm not saying that this is a this can't be educational in some type of gadget review sentiment, but in what context are you damaging the phone through flex uh, force in one direction and then Comp further compromising the phone with the same style fine point application of force in the opposite direction. And so to me, it's, it's not as instructive as it is entertaining, but that's why I like, I fix it, you know, show me an, I fix it tear down and you can get a really good sense of, Oh, that's going to be a trouble point. That's going to be a problem for the battery. That's going to be the screen assembly. The frame of that phone looks like it could be compromised here or here. And I feel better prepared to talk about, ways that you can protect that gadget maybe you maybe you don't need much maybe you just need some sort of like aesthetic snap-on case maybe you really should be considering a bumper this is a phone where i don't think you should leave the house without an armor case and a glass screen protector that's really the conversation we're trying to have i don't believe i bent phone phone broke don't buy phone is the right conversation i think i looked at the structural integrity of this gadget it failed under these situations. These are the cases that could that could uh, fix those problems. Is a better, or I think a a a more journalistic attempt at at having that conversation. <laughs> Root night five. I don't like calling a four hundred dollar phone dirt cheap. Honestly, <laughs> no, I feel you there. Again, I mean, like, I, I just did all of this demo on my Stylo 6, which uh, cost me $156 with tax and shipping on uh, on Boost Mobile. And for $156, I feel like 
that's the new threshold for for phones. <laughs> like, don't buy that phone anywhere near full MSRP. Shop it on a sale. And that is a stonking amount of phone for 150 bucks. And Goran Petrovic. I mean, again, I think this is a totally fair assessment. You know, Goran says, I don't like it, but put Velvet to Nord and totally justifiable price increases to, uh, uh, for levels above for LG. Again, there's a lot that we can criticize about Velvet. There's a lot that we can criticize about Nord. These price tiers matter for what it is that you get. You can, you can say chipset to chipset, but you're ignoring an entire feature set, build quality, um, accessories availability. For once, like I'm more excited about the accessories that are compatible with an LG on the Velvet than I am a OnePlus, where normally OnePlus like blows me away, cases and earbuds and fast chargers and all this cool stuff. And then you're like, yeah, but my Velvet has stylus support. <laughs> That's kind of a big deal. <laughs> DTNL Juan rigs everything. Well, don't say it like that because then it sounds like I'm I'm disreputable. <laughs> and Sentinel nine oh nine. I mean, again, I'll, I'll always bring up a comment that references the V ten, but the LG V ten had those stainless steel rails, and I put my V ten through so much abuse. Um, it's on its third screen protector, and that screen protector is cracked too. Um, and it's still. It, it, it's still coming back for more. That V10 was such a tank. I really wish we still made um, phones like that. <laughs> Simon says, Hypno, I don't know. Jerry Riggs everything is very relevant to anyone employed as a phone bender. <laughs> My wife just started, we just started um, binging uh, Futurama again. So I now like, you know, there's a bender Rodriguez that does nothing but test the structural integrity of phones. And, and on that note, this, this podcast has already gone way longer than I intended it to. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling we'll probably see Corning Victus uh, come in early next year on Galaxies, but I'm hoping we can get just a little bit more of a follow-up. And I might reach out to the Corning PR team too, just to see like, you know, will, will we be able to get kind of a list of early launch devices? I'm very curious. I'm very curious when it comes to material science and... Um, and, and how we improve gadget durability. If, if some of these claims, if we can kind of keep an eye out, because anything that makes our devices better longer term investments is, is gonna be appreciated. You know, a phone that doesn't get smashed or cracked is easily under general lifestyle abuse, helps prevent some e-waste. It helps us you know, manage a, a phone purchase a little bit longer. We get a little bit more life out of it. You know, we have other problems that we need to keep up with, software support and uh, updates and security and, and all these things. It'd be nice if the actual housing for those software components didn't instantly fail if you looked at it cross-eyed on a sunny day. So, um, oh, JJ saying Note 20, Victus. I don't think so. The way that Corning put this out, I'm pretty confident that we'll see it early 2021 I don't think we're going to see anything arriving uh, this year with Victus. But it again, it, I'm really anxious. Qualcomm component pricing is going to be higher. Corning, I believe, the, you know, they, they have an entirely new brand name for this glass. They're so confident in its improved performance. That has to come with a couple more dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and in two spirits samsung note 10 pro foldable with victus transparent aluminum uh, sign me up again if you have transparent folding aluminum on on a galaxy fold i'll finally be way more excited about folding phones <laughs> being a bit more durable than they currently are which again i you know I, folds don't do anything for me right now ah all right Let's wrap this up. Folks, thanks so much for joining me on this crazy scattered podcast morning, as always. Some really interesting news stories that we got to keep our eyes on. Um, I, I'm thinking I'm going to try and do a Wednesday stream, either here on Twitch or on YouTube. But we've got to talk about uh, what's going on with antitrust when the top major tech companies are getting called before uh, 
you know, elected officials to, to start answering some questions on this stuff. Like we, we got to keep our eye on where those conversations go. But um, uh, along the way, I'm also going to be having some more videos coming out. I've got a teaser. Um, oh, do I still have my Patreon up? It, it's already live on the Patreon as a preview video. But I had a fun little showdown between a phone and a gimbal, just talking about uh, stabilization for video. And uh, I was very surprised by the results. So I, I'm hoping that folks will be commenting on and voting on what's coming down the pipe there. I've got audio kit. Um, I got a little cute uh, home phone set up for Republic Wireless. Uh, earbuds and earbuds and earbuds and a portable monitor. I don't know if I'm going to get to all of it uh, this week, but there's going to be a lot. So it's going to be a, a fun ride. And, and this is kind of going hand in hand with, again, I, I get cranky when I just spend too much time focused on phone after phone after phone after phone. So it's time to kind of spread back out again. More accessories, a few more feature videos. I, I want to do more tips and tricks stuff. And that's what I think we're going to be kind of looking at as we get into the second half of the year um, after some of these other major phone launches are out. So um, you can catch all of the information from this week's podcast, somegadgetguy.com, show notes and, and links to all of the articles that we discussed. And then also just a huge thank you to those of you out there sharing and supporting not only content creators, but then also some of my initiatives like Glowing Rectangles, the subreddit on uh, reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. Uh, this has been a really great week for spreading the word on content that deserves more attention um, from friends of mine doing their own streams. TK had an awesome stream uh, this week to also expanding on new shows like Sam and Matt, who came straight out of this community, just became buddies and started doing their own tech commentary. It, this is this is what we should be living for is finding new cool stuff to get excited about and to share and to talk about. So I, I want to thank you all for being along on this ride and for being good tech neighbors in your own circles of family and friends. So folks, you know where you can catch me around the whole rest of the internet on the Twitters and here on the Twitch and I'm never on Facebook. If you send me a comment on Facebook, I'm never going to see it. Facebook is 99.9% .9 autopilot at this point. So you can send me something and you can watch me there, but I'm probably not going to notice and YouTube and all those other places too. So uh, I, I look forward to our continuing conversations over this next week and the months and the years to follow. I want you to have an amazing week. I want you to do awesome with your technology. I want you to be awesome with your technology. And I hope you'll catch next week, another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show. Be well, stay safe as the world is crazier than it's ever been. Don't take any unnecessary risks. Wash your hands, wear a mask, and I'll catch you back here next week. I love you all. Take care.